The Trinity Explained has become a pretty popular video. However, since I uploaded it, some objections have been raised. So in this video, I will answer some of the most used objections and end this video by strengthening the logical argument for the Trinity. I will not be dealing with objections from scripture, as I've already done that in these videos. Now before I get started, some have said I'm comparing God to a cube, which is an out of context claim. What I'm saying is trying to explain God to man is like trying to explain a cube to a two dimensional being. Never once do I say God is like a cube. So moving on to real objections, some have objected with the idea that even though God is hyperdimensional, he can still just be a unitarian being. Well this is possible, but it doesn't metaphysically follow that God is also limited this way. Because something hyperdimensional has to have greater possibility than other things in lesser dimensions. This is the main point in my previous video, and here is that argument in a nutshell. God is greater than us in all properties. So humans have power, but God is greater by being all-powerful. Humans have knowledge, but God is greater by being omniscient. Humans can love, but God is greater that he is all-loving. Humans can only be Unitarian, so God therefore can also only be Unitarian? Well no, that doesn't make sense. God is greater than us in all properties and abilities. So he has to be greater than us in this ability as well, meaning he has the ability to be multi-personal. C.S. Lewis says, The human level is a simple and rather empty level. On the human level, one person is one being, and any two persons are two separate beings. Just as in two dimensions, say on a flat sheet of paper, one square is one figure, and any two squares are two separate figures. On the divine level, you still find personalities, but up there, you find them combined in new ways which we, who do not live on that level, cannot imagine. In God's dimension, so to speak, you find a being who is three persons while remaining one being, just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Of course, we cannot fully conceive of a being like that, just as, if we were so made that we perceived only two dimensions in space, we could never properly imagine a cube. But we can get a sort of faint notion of it, and when we do, we are then, for the first time in our lives, getting some positive idea, however faint, of something super personal, something more than a person. It is something we could never have guessed, and yet, once we have been told, one almost feels one ought to have been able to guess it because it fits so well with all the things we know already. So it doesn't make sense to say God is also Unitarian. He is greater in all properties and abilities. So many have asked, why isn't God more than three persons? Wouldn't it be better to be a million persons? Well, God could, but quantity in essence doesn't make something greater. Because no matter how many eternal persons God is, he still is one omnipotent, omniscient God. Being more persons doesn't change that. What I said was, is the ability to be more persons is greater than the ability to only be one person. It is not about quantity, it is about the ability. So God can be as many eternal persons as he eternally wills. But scripture says he is only three. Remember, this explanation is not supposed to explain all the ins and outs of the triune God. That would be impossible. It is merely to refute the claim that the Trinity doesn't make sense. Now moving on to the next objection, didn't God create space and time? If God created space and time, he must be independent of them. Therefore, God cannot have spatial dimensions because God is spaceless and timeless. Well, this is true, and I do not have a problem with this argument. Except that it is assuming that by me saying God is hyperdimensional, I am saying God is spatial. When actually, saying God is hyperdimensional is simply an analogous way to say God transcends space and time. Dr. William Lane Craig says, It is a commonplace of traditional theology that God exists extradimensionally and that he transcends both time and space. So saying God exists hyperdimensionally is simply a way to say God transcends this world and is not bound by the same rules we are. We cannot confuse something intended to be an analogous claim with an actual identity claim. Now to finish up, not only does the idea of a Unitarian God not logically follow in terms of dimensions, there are other logical problems with the concept of a Unitarian God. If God is not multipersonal, then perfect love is not an essential attribute of God. Perfect love can only exist between two or more persons. So until God created someone else, there was no love. This means God is eternally all-powerful, but not eternally loving. And power is at the essence of God, but not love. So when Unitarians say God is love, they are also saying God is dependent on his creation. Since the only way God can love is if there is someone else to love. But that is absurd, because for God to be God, he must be dependent on no one, and everything must be dependent on him. Only a multi-personal God is a morally perfect loving God and is dependent on no one or nothing. 
Also denying the Trinity creates problems in terms of Christian salvation. If Jesus isn't God and is just a created being, then should we pray to him? The Bible clearly calls us to pray to Jesus, but if he isn't the omniscient, infinite God, can he truly answer our prayers? And are we to reject Paul's teaching to worship the Creator and not the created? We are also attributing salvation to a created being and not to God himself. Is any created being who is by definition limited in power, knowledge, and love really able to take on the full weight of salvation and defeat sin and death? Doesn't scripture say salvation comes from the Lord and never once does it say salvation can come from any created being? We also make God even less loving and powerful, being that he couldn't or would not willingly come himself to save us, but instead sent a created being. This makes God distant and slightly apathetic towards us, since he only sent a servant to do something that is considered to be the most important and loving act in the history of mankind. So God becomes distant and unloving if he is only a Unitarian being. So looking back, we now see that the Trinity was not made up at the Council of Nicaea. It is in the Old Testament, obviously in the New Testament, common objections have been dealt with, and it is logically valid, as indicated by this video and my previous one. So we can easily conclude that there is no reason to reject the teaching that God is complex in his nature and multi-personal.